So thank you very much for inviting, inviting me to speak here and thank you very much for coming to my talk. So I will talk about a notion of k-regularity. Com it comes from topology. And uh, this is about joint work with a uh, with couple of people. So there is Tadeusz Januszkiewicz. Joachim Jelisiejew. So everybody's name you can do check. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is Mateusz Michałek. All Polish. All Polish. <laughs> okay. So what does it mean, uh, this strange thing on the top? So it's, um, I will start with a, with a small detour for to topology. So we, we look at continuous maps from R from R M to R capital N such that the images of any distinct points k distinct points are linearly independent. So you want obviously x1 to be different, xi to be different from xj for i not equal to j. So if you have a map from, uh, like, well, more generally, any manifold to, R, to Rn, then you say it's k-regular if and only if the following property holds. So the image of any k points is linearly independent. And this is about, it, this is a notion from topology, so we want f to be continuous or differentiable if you are a differential geometer. And if you are very lucky, you might want it to be holomorphic or algebraic or something like this. Skill points are not necessarily independent. Hmm? Skill points. If what? S, I, S, J. Yeah, M could be one. Yeah. M, M could be one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It still makes sense. Yes. There's a, a definition. I mean, not, I'm not saying every map is k-regular. These are very special maps. And then the topologists, and also in approximation theory, people are interested in what is given given k and m. So you fix the dimension of the source, and you fix the this k here. What is the minimal? N. Yes. So like this guy. Right, so the simplest example would be exactly what Joseph said. So rational normal curve. So you take, well, okay, here I've already switched to complex numbers because I'm algebraic geometer and R is kind of inconvenient field. So you can do the same definition for complex numbers and it's gonna work. So you take a you take a, a map from C1 to CK defined by 1 T, T square and higher powers of T up to TK minus 1 and this map is going to be K regular. I will tell a little bit more about the other examples in a minute. Let me just, this was just because jo Joseph mentioned rational normal curves. And 
then uh, with this question topologies can handle to some extent so they can provide lower bounds on n so they can prove theorems so topological theorems are well of the type with for fixed k and m n must be at least and they give some formula depending on k and m I will quote one of those formula in in a, uh, in a minute, but let me just stress that this is the main uh, ability of topologists and this is great and very powerful, but with algebraic geometry we have a tool to construct nice k-regular maps better than they knew before from topology. And this is so the... So your n is for the existence of this k-regular map? Oh. Yes, so I'm, the, I'm as answering the question. So given k and m, what would be the minimal n such that the k regular map exists? Right, so let me tell you what are the theorems. So the, everything I say can be uh, also converted to real numbers. So algebraic, algebraic geometry is uh, powerful enough to prove theorems on real numbers. Maybe they are not as uh, strong as in the case of complex numbers. But from now on, I will only restrict to the complex numbers because I don't want to uh, go into too much details about real algebraic geometry which would be necessary at the end. So now I'm killing my real, num real field and replacing it with complex numbers. Sorry for that. So the, the, the theorems that we proved are the following. So there exists f from c m to c n and this can be taken differentiable or if you are happy it's just continuous uh, whenever n is equal to m plus 1 times k minus 1 and this is going to be k regular This, your, this is the theorem. You're saying a theorem? Yeah, this is a theorem of the four authors. So this is just some number, and it turned out to be better than what was known before for most cases. And that's one. That's part one of the theorem. If my integers, initial integers, are sufficiently small, if k is at least, well, sorry, at most 9, or m is at most 2, then uh, there exists again the same map for n equal. m times k minus 1 plus 1 so it's this this integer integer is slightly smaller and we expect that this should be the right this is the the right one except we can't prove it yet so our method proves this and in spe in easy cases we can go down to that but it's kind of that number is the upper bound. Yes, this is the upper uh, bound. So I'm saying that there exists a k regular map if I take as n this integer or anything larger than that, but it doesn't really matter. 
Right, so let me just compare this to these topological theorems. So the topological theorems, the strongest one and the most recent one is due to Blagojevich, not a Polish one. <laughs> Cohen and Luke and Ziegler. So mainly, well, so, so German, American, and Serbian thing, team. It's um, and that they say that there is. No k regular map. Continuous k regular map from C M to C N. If N is less or equal M times k minus alpha of k, I will explain what alpha is, what alpha is, plus alpha of k minus 1 over 2, where alpha of k is the number of ones in the binary exp expansion of k. Okay. So for example if you have if k is equal if k is equal to three or maybe better five Then 5 in the binary expansion is 1, 0, 1, which makes alpha of k equal oh, 5. Hmm? Alpha of 5 equals yeah. Alpha of 5 <laughs> equal <laughs> 2, thank you. And then they say that n is less or equal m times k minus 2 plus yes, 2, two minus 1 over 2 is this correct? something like this and cannot be and cannot be a, 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 of this 3 yeah. and you get existence for 4 yes so still there is a discrepancy between this and that. But if I took, if k was power of k uh, uh, 2 to the i, then you can see that this, this bound and that, that bound actually coincide. But fortunately for 5, it's not the best that they, they can do. They can do a little bit better if k is a prime number. And maybe I will not list that. But for prime number, they get they exactly match our bound. So they say that the, there cannot be anything less than that. So we conjecture that this is the right bound for every integer. But that's maybe not so important as the techniques that we are using, since you were. You mean you conjectured this bound for m bigger than two? Yes, sir. Well, you are saying that for some values this is incorrect no what oh that i'm well the conjecture is that this is the minimal number for every m and k for and the maybe is differentiable in that algebra it's not algebraic. I will t I'll explain you in, in a minute why. So let me give you. So the, well, in in small cases, this can be all made explicit. 
So, for example, if we are looking for three Lagrange maps, the optimal one, this one was well known before, it's very simple. So it's, you just take, uh, well, the, the, the unit, because you want them to be linearly dependent, so in particular you don't want to go to zero. You, you take all the linear variables and you get also squares of variables. So you don't get, you, you don't take them mixed terms. So the, for instance, you don't write t1 times t2. Just variables and their squares. And this is in, enough to get the three regular map. And incidentally, this is algebraic. You can see this is an algebraic map. Similarly, you can take, a four, you can write the, a four regular map you just take ST uh, for regular map from 2 C2 to C7 and you write it in with this formula. So there is uh, again a unit, there are linear variables and there are some ex polynomial expressions. Now let me just underline here, it w these were only monomials. Here it gets more complicated, there is a binomial here. There. So uh, monomials are not good enough for four regular maps anymore except in the case m equal 1. Now the fourth example is perhaps the most interesting in, uh, out of those listed here. So, well I wrote down a map and it's not so important what's the map, what is the map, but it is kind of mixture of monomials and some binomials and binomials were enough. But I'm not claiming this is k regular. What I'm claiming is k regular, four regular actually, on, only on a small disk around zero. So it's not k, k regular everywhere. So I shouldn't write, really write it as uh, a map from C3 to C10. C10. It's only a map from a disk, three-dimensional complex disk, complex three-dimensional disk to C10. But, since we are working for topologists, we don't care, because topologists don't care. For them, to a disk is exactly the same thing as a whole big affine space. So, they are, uh, so, so the map from the disk is good enough for the purpose of these applications. And, uh, to be honest, I don't know if this is k-regular everywhere. Uh, we were not made, we were not able to verify this. We were able to verify this in the smaller, smaller cases and also in this last one. Uh, well, we don't know, and we don't we don't really know if uh, if we construct the higher dimensional examples, if we will be able to fi always find one that's k regular everywhere. So what is small? Uh, that we don't know either. So it's some but, but it's small. not infinitesimal. It's there, there yeah, there, there exists a, a finite, yes, yes a positive radius disk. And for all you know, that radius could be infinite. Hmm? Uh, I well, I don't even know if it's if the radius is infinite or not. Hmm. I know there exists a yeah, finite. Strictly positive, though. Yes. So you see, compactness is very uh, is a very nice property. You can do a lot of things with compactness. So, uh, what is our approach? Well, this is not incidental that I'm in a company to Joseph. So our approach is secant varieties, at least to some extent. Uh, so let's. Let's see what. So the, the idea is that we start with a nice k regular map that we all know, and we probably already know what would be a k regular map from C n to C some C n with very large n, and then we try to correct it. So what would be the the, the map? A k regular map that you know of. Do you know of an k regular map? Some professors here at least know. 
you don't know. Okay, so then let me tell you. So we look at Veronese map. And maybe let me talk about Veronese map for between projective spaces, just to be... Um, D plus M choose M and then minus 1 or something like this. Yes, yeah, so this map is even D plus 1 regular. This map is D plus 1 regular. So let me come back to the first example that was here. Where is my joke? So the first example, how do you see this is k-regular? Do you know how to, how, how to prove that this map is k-regular? Dendermann. Yes, there is this determinant, which is Vandermann determinant. And if you take k points on the, in complex number, take k complex numbers, and you write them in a matrix, so you write k by k matrix with uh, with these entries uh, for each of these points so the, the, the each row will have this one in the first co column and the number in, in the second column and so on the square of the number in the, the third column and for each point you write a row like this you take the matrix and you take its determinant which is called Vandermond determinant you find out that it's zero if and only if that well some of those points are equal. So that's this means that this is exactly the definition of the k regularity. And with the same argument, a little bit more complicated perhaps, but not much more complicated, you can prove that Veronese map from projective space to the biggest projective space is d plus 1 regular, it's always d plus 1 regular. So it's, I can write it's k regular for all k less equal than d plus 1. Do you know what is the Veronese map? What does it look like? Yes, some people do, some people don't. So let me just quickly write it. So Vd of x1 of t1 up to maybe of from t0 to tm is the point in the projective space which which has coordinates t0 to the d, t0 to the d minus 1, t1, and so on. You write all the monomials of the grid d, <coughs> tm to the d. Okay. And if you want to write a Veronese map from Cm to Cn, then it's you just set T0 equal to 1 and it's the same map. So for Veronese from Cm to Cn, just write V0 of, of T1 Tm to be 1 T1 Tm. So we you list all the monomials of degree at most D. Right, so but this is huge. This number is huge compared to those the topologies listed and those that are in the theorem. So what can we do to make it better? So uh, for to make it better, we can well project in a, some smart way to some different Pn prime. So we take a linear projection, but we want the k regularity property to be preserved. So how to do this? 
So the linear projection we, we have its kernel. So the so our linear projection between projective spaces will come from a map of vector spaces C n plus one to C n prime plus one. And there will be a kernel of pi, the projectivization of this kernel, let me call it Z. This is a subspace of the projective space Pn. If Z does not intersect the kth secant variety of this Veronese of Veronese of Pn, then the composed map we start with Cm or Pm, whatever. You take the Veronese to do the first one. And then you, you take the projection, this is a rational map, it's not defined everywhere, but we don't care because it's well defined on this Pn. You end up in Pn prime. And the composition is again k regular. Why? Well, since we have our Veronese, let me draw the, the favorite picture of Joseph. We have, well, let, let it be the, even the secant variety of the, well, let, let it be Veronese. Now we have uh, the Veronese, and here is, somewhere here is the center of the projection. And I know that this center of projection avoids does not intersect by any plane spanned by, spanned by k points of my Veronese. The intersection between this guy and that secant k plane is empty in projective space. So it, in the affine space it's just zero. So after the projection, these k points will still be linearly independent, because I have my k-dimensional plane, or k-1-dimensional projective plane, and I have my linear space here. They are complementary, they, are, they don't intersect. So after projection I only contract this, and this remains unharmed. So this still becomes, uh, still is k-regular after the projection. Great! So, the easy thing I can do is I can take projection from, a, from something disjoint from this secant variety, which will be any, well, which will be a general plane of complementary dimension which already gives a big simplification, but of course this, this was not original. This was well known about 100 years ago. Uh, more, maybe a little bit less. <laughs> and, uh, well, this actually appeared for two regular maps, or for embeddings, this appeared in the Whitney's first proof or that any manifold can be embedded in the 2m plus 1 dimensional real. Uh, affine space. Right, but the, the idea that we have is that well, we don't need the whole Veronese variety. Let me draw, draw another picture of the same type. So, we, we are, we would be very, since we are looking at the K-regular map from the affine space. As I said before, we will be equally happy to have a k-regular map from a disk. So we take a small disk 
around some point. Let's say this point. Now we want we only want our plane. Let me draw bigger plane so that you see this is really bigger. That that avoids secants between four points only within this disk. So they will be some secants, but they all will be contained in the disk. Let me draw a bit uh, more simplified picture so that you see that there is actually a difference. So it has the same dimension as the original secant, but it's, now we are outside of algebraic geometry. Not, it's not true anymore that the, secant, the closure of the secant in, the ter in uh, uh, Zariski topology is the same as the closure of the secants in Euclidean topology because we are looking at secants to only a small analytic disk, not to a, an algebraic variety. So let me just show you an, a simple e example. So I'm taking two secants of a parabola. So if you take the secant variety of the parabola, the whole parabola, you can get to any point. If you give me any point, I pick a random curve, uh, a random line, and it will hit the parabola in two points. So this random point is on a secant, on a two secant line from uh, to this parabola. But if instead I will take the same parabola, but I only look at the secants in a small disk. So I take this some points here. So you can see that if I take this point here, this will not be in any secant that's spun by, by something from this disk. Right? Okay, so I'm just by going out of, from algebraic geometry for a minute, I will come back to algebraic geometry, I've managed to get a point which was not here before. So it was not, the, the point here was not uh, good enough because it, it was contained in some secant, but it is good enough for the disk. Then I can take, well, I, well, now I would like to know how big the linear space I can be here. For that, I need to go back to algebraic geometry. And how do I do this? I take the disk smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it suffices that, the, that what we get in the limit is avoided by the linear space. Because if it, uh, if it avoids the limit, then by compactness arguments, I can show that it avoids it in some neighborhood. So those are, for some small disks, it will be fine. So I want to as un understand the limiting object. And this is where Hilbert scheme of points comes in. I, <coughs> what I need, I need uh, some kind of compact space which, param which parameterizes in particular finite, num finite bunches of points, so k points, for example. So it's called Hilbert scheme of x, or of any variety. In this case, we are looking at <coughs> Cn, Cn. So Hilbert scheme of k points in a maybe let, it, let, let me put it p n for now because I want compactness is the well you can it's a it's a scheme but you can think of it as a variety for now because we are not going to use the scheme structure so it's a, a variety which parameterizes finite subschemes of a, of projective space. Of 
its length k. So what are finite subschemes uh, of length k? Well, these are, well, for example, k different points on, in the projective space make a finite subscheme of, of length k. But also, we, there are limiting uh, schemes. So if I, if I have two points, I can get, I can move one point toward, towards the other, and I get some kind of limiting object at the end. So like a point counted with multiplicity, but also some extra structure that tells me from which direction they, they came from. And this, the point is that this is projective with scheme. So if you don't know what are schemes, this is, you think, can think of it as variety, but in more general sense, perhaps perhaps reducible. So, in particular, it's, it's, it, uh, it is compact from the point of view top of topology. So, it's a compactive, well, you can think of it as a compactification of, of, uh, uh, of the space parameterizing finite number of points. But, it also contains, uh, uh, well, it may contain other irreducible components, which is a bit painful. Um, let me draw you a picture of this. So, we have several irreducible components. It's a bit confusing picture, but let me not go into too many details. So there is a big open subset okay, which parameterizes k distinct points. points. Then there is one irreducible component, which is a closure of this big open subset. So this is closure of blue guy. And, but there also may be a different irreducible component, which are not so important for us today, because we will be only interested in this compactification. But the point is that here there is maybe you let me use different color. This is uh, this is a, a subset of here of this subset parameterizing schemes supported at a single point. Single point, say, x0. So what, what does it mean? We are doing exactly the same thing as here. We take our k di distinct points and then we converge them to a single point. So we get a single point with multiplicity k, but we've, we can get many different structures uh, on, this, on this point. And this is the subset parameterizing exactly those limits. Well, I should add and obtained as a limit. As a limit of k points. 
So there might be some similar subschemes in the other components, which we again don't care about. And the subset, every point in the subset is obtained as a limit of k plus. Yes. Yes. So the subset parameterizing schemes supported at a single point and obtained as a limit of, k, of, the, of the point of k plus. Closed subset. It is a closed subset, exactly. And like for, so for, so let me just, I think I can erase the examples for now. So you might, rem might remember from Joseph's lectures that the second variety of a subvariety of projective space is defined as a closure of the linear spans of, a, of some sets where R is equal to P1 up to PK, just K distinct points in X. And you take the closure of that. But it is also equal, using our new tool, it doesn't matter if you take on the spans of these k points, you can also take the span of the bigger thing, the closure of these k points here. So it's also defined as a linear, sp as a union of, oh, sorry, forgot union as a linear span of R, where R is in this Hilbert scheme. And let me write SM for smoothable, and this means that this is in this uh, s s distinguished component. Maybe let's just do this top smooth. PM. Well, I was talking about X, let me just talk let me just talk more about X. And even though I take this, I still need to take closure at least sometimes. And, uh, well, but what we are interested in now is only this part, right? Remember this part of the Hilbert scheme, because we, we decrease our disk and we take the limits of the, our point. So we are looking at the areal of X, which I define to be the union of the linear spans of the linear spans of R from where R is in the, um, well, let me not define it, let me just draw the yellow line the same color as before, right? So here is the, the yellow line, line st stands for the closed subset parameterizing subschemes supported as a single point x0. I should what, maybe reference to x0, which is not so important. And obtained as a limit of k points. So you mean every point in yellow stuff uh, has information of uh, the limit, limit and the, the, the dimension is uh, already the same, the, the span of r. So the this span of R, this span of R, or, or, or this dimension of that, I'm taking closure, by the way. The span of R, that dimension will be always uh, K. 
guarantee? If for Veronese, yes. If I'm then otherwise, it's not guaranteed. So it's a general R. General R will have dimension, the expected dimension. Okay. So now, I, what I want, I want to calculate the dimension of this guy, or at least bound it. And then I can project from a complementary dimension to this guy, by the argument that I told you. That then if it's outside of this linear spans, then at least for some very small disk, it will, the, the linear sp space will not intersect uh, the secants within only this um, this guy, right? And then this is this is how I obtained the theorem. Let me check how much time I still have. Okay, it's a bit, I have a little bit of time, so I can tell you about the calculations. This yellow color will show up several times. Um, so we have. So first of all, this dimension of. Well, well, let let me just state the theorem just to make sure that we we know where we are. So theorem I claim is if uh, I fix for <coughs> fixed. A and M, uh, there exists a K regular, a continuous or differentiable K regular map from CM, CM to n if n is at least the dimension of the areal variety okay, if areal variety of the Veronese variety pn at some point x0 and then there might be plus one because I at some point I've switched to projective space and then I need to blow it up to give, have the linear maps. So I want to calculate this dimension of areal variety. Or at least to have, have a, to show that this is bigger than something. So that's the theorem that I justified so far and I want to continue by uh, showing the, the actual bound. Let me leave the part, part of the picture, at least the yellow color, which is important. So now this areal variety arises as a union of linear spans each of the linear spans is of dimension at most k minus 1. So this areal variety let me not put stuff here is well at least it's bounded from above by dimension of the of the yellow stuff in the Hilbert scheme. So exactly this thing plus the dimension of a linear span of a typical typical scheme here, which is equal to the dimension of the yellow guy and uh, plus k minus 1. So remember that this areal variety comes from a fixed point. So there is a 
I just fix, I have just one point. And now I have my irreducible variety, which I already erased, unluckily. Let me redraw it. I have my irreducible variety of smoothable schemes. I have this big open subset. I have a real variety for one. Sorry, I have this uh, yellow subset for one of the points. But for any other point, I also have another subs yellow subset like that. Maybe I will mark the other points with red. So this is so these are schemes supported at x0. And these are schemes supported by some, un, some other x2, though, y, or z, and so on, right? So we have a bunch of those guys sitting in the same Hilbert scheme. And this Hilbert scheme has a big, op has big open subset of dimension m times r. So here the open subset is dim has dimension equal to m times r, uh, times k, I'm sorry. k is the number of points, m is the dimension of the variety. If I have a k points on a variety, this, is, this has dimension m times k. So the boundary, this is, uh, we are in algebraic geometry, we are not in analysis anymore. So the boundary has dimension at least one less. So the dimension of the yellow of the union of of the yellow stuff and all the red stuff is at most m m times k minus one. And each of these guys is the same, right? This is, uh, it doesn't matter which point I take. And so, dimension of a single guy, so dimension of just yellow guy, is less or equal than um, m times k minus one, so this is what was before, minus the dimension of the variety, which is m, because I have m dimension of family parameterizing the red or yellow guys. So I have, uh, I have my first bound. This is the first theorem that we had. If, you, if I didn't make any mistake, and if, the, uh, if, if you add up these numbers, you get the first theorems for any k, and uh, m, you get the dimension of, of this cn to be at most, well, you have to combine all these statements so is here. Is this the same estimate you get as if you take, instead of um, the, in the boundary, you have the one supported at k minus one points, which must be one dimension less, and the one supported at k minus two points, which must be one dimension even less further, etc. It's um, the, the bound, like as you say, is not true. Ah. So you can get uh, a, a, a scheme supported at, at a single point in a way that doesn't come from a limiting one, one by one. So it's this nasty Hilbert scheme, which is which has very many, very. Yes, I remember. So it's very delicate, and there are examples for that. So it would be very nice, mm -hmm. but it would give a better bound, mm -hmm. but it's not so lucky. Yeah, do you have questions? Right, so let me tell you just a tiny little bit of, about the second theorem for this, I need to introduce Gorenstein's scheme. So if I have R in my Hilbert scheme, uh, so R is a finite subscheme scheme 
of x of length k, k then I say it might be a different definition that you have heard if you've ever heard this definition R is Gorenstein if and only if R is not a union well let me let me put it sorry let me phrase it different way if and only if there are only there exists only finitely many sub schemes q in r of length k minus 1 and that, that's it so let me I will let you di digest it for a second and let me just show the this on examples if you know the schemes so if you have a finite set of points the only way to obtain a, a sub scheme of length one less is just to take to pick k minus one of those points so you just throw out one point and you can throw out one point only in finitely many ways if you have a scheme which is say spectrum of c of epsilon divided by epsilon to any power but let me just talk about two and then this is this is say one point of the support and then there is another point of the support then what you, what can you do to obtain the scheme of lengths two it's either take this guy or take reduced point and the other point so there are only again only finitely many ways to do that there is let me just let me give you another example of non gorenstein scheme on the other hand so you take the spectrum of c of x y and you divide it by x square uh, x y y square so it's a bit like this guy except it has like a tangent plane of uh, it has plane as a tangent space not not just line so it's let me just draw it in this way so it's a big tangent plane now it doesn't have finitely many sub schemes you can take any line you can intersect it with any line through this point it will be a, a sub scheme of this bigger scheme you will get a scheme like that but you can have the arrow pointing in any direction you want and this is example of non gorenstein scheme and and there are many equivalent ways of phrasing this property i'm only interested in this one for today it's an important property in algebra and in algebraic geometry so why do I care? So the point is that I, I took my union over here over all schemes which are in this this yellow thing but I could also well I could reduce this so let me look again at this example if I have, if I have a linear span of that of that plane then this then this linear span is a union of li of those lines. So I, if I have a point in in the linear span of this plane, of this scheme of length three, each point on this plane can be expressed using smaller scheme. So let me re let me re replace this definition. Well. Okay, let me not replace the definition. Let me write it to be contained 
in some other space, which is the union of all linear spans of R, such that R is Gorenstein of length K supported at a fixed point x0. And then again I need to take closure just in case. <coughs> so, so, okay, so why didn't I do here um, the equation? Because this smaller scheme, well for this case it's not, but for this smaller scheme might not be smoothable anymore. And in general, Gorenstein schemes might not be limits of distinct points. So, even though the big thing is uh, limit of k distinct points, this smaller one might not be a limit of distinct points. And I have no way of telling uh, from, well, okay, I have ways to tell it, but not, nothing that helps me to, to calculate the dimensions. And then we can. Uh, make a slightly better bound for this set of Gorenstein schemes when we have when the dimension is rather smallish, and this is how we get the second theorem. Okay, I think you are all tired, so I will stop here. And thank you very much for attention.